You can be seated. Uh, this is the time. If you have kids that are headed to Children's Church, they can go with Ms. Melody out the back um, so that you can head that way. Um, again, my name is Rondi Taylor. I am the pastor here. We are excited and blessed today to have uh, Dr. Jeff Orge. He is the president of Gateway Seminary, which is one of our convention six seminaries, uh, and he is here with us today. and He's going to share the message, uh, and he, uh, we're excited to have him. So, Dr. Orge, it's all you. Thanks, Rondi. What he didn't say is what really brings me to Green River about three times a year is my three grandchildren. And so I'm delighted to be here to see you as well, although, quite frankly, oh, no, I won't say it that way. I'm really mostly glad to be here at the church, right, Rondi? Is that what I need to, what I need to say? All right. Open your Bibles with me to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians is in the New Testament, about the middle. So if you can turn to Colossians chapter 3. In just a moment, I'm going to read a passage of Scripture, which is going to be the foundation for today's message. Christian unity. Christian unity. Sounds good, doesn't it? But it's frankly more of an aspiration than a reality. Think about your spouse. You want to have unity with your Christian spouse. Think about your children. You're a Christian family, and you'd really like to have unity with your family. And then, what about your church? Christian unity. You'd like for the church to always all just be unified, one, focus, together. Christian unity, it's important. Jesus prayed for it. In one of the longest prayers in the Bible, in John chapter 17. And our ethic as Christians demands it. We sense that we're supposed to be unified and together and cooperative with each other. And quite honestly, our hearts long for it. We, we don't like it when we're having conflict with our spouse or conflict in our, with our children or conflict in our church. We don't like that. Our hearts long for unity. But the reality is, it seems more an elusive dream than a practical reality. But fortunately, the Bible does more than give us a mandate to be unified. It actually tells us how. And so what I'd like to do this morning is walk with you through a passage of Scripture in Colossians chapter 3, which lays out for us some practical steps to have greater unity with other Christians Unity with our Christian spouses, our Christian children, our Christian families, our Christian churches. Greater unity. Start with me in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 11. The Bible says, In Christ there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore... As God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievous, grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are, are also to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly, or dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This passage begins by teaching us that our unity is grounded in our relationship to Jesus Christ. Look back at verse 11. This verse says that all differences have been overcome among Christians in Jesus Christ. It says, in Christ there's not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free, but Christ is all and in all. 
Look at these phrases. The phrase no Greek or Jew means that all racial differences have been overcome. The phrase no circumcision or uncircumcision means all religious differences have been overcome. The phrase barbarian, Scythian, slave are free means that all cultural and legal status differences have been overcome in Jesus Christ. What this is telling us is pretty clear. Unity is possible no matter the divisions around us because of our relationship with Jesus. Now let's update this for today. If we were making our own list and contrasting different groups that are at odds with one another today, we would say, well, Republicans and Democrats. How about vaccinated and unvaccinated? How about masked and unmasked? How about black and white? You go down through this list in the Bible, and you can make your own list in our context today. And what the Bible is saying is this. There's a lot that divides us in our world. There's a lot that divides us. But in Christ, all of that has been overcome. And as Christians, we have the legitimate capacity for unity. Now, not only are we made, do we have unity in Jesus Christ, but then it says at the beginning of verse 12, continuing, that we also have equality in him. It says, we're now God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved. I like this phrasing and how it puts all these three things together so simply. Holiness and love are the two primary qualities of God. And the Bible says we've been made able to, we've, we've been able, we've come to share both of those in our relationship to God through Jesus. We have holiness and love. And then the first phrase, we're God's chosen ones. Do you remember back in the day when you went to school and they picked teams? And I was experiencing this so many years ago that there was no political correctness about it they picked out a couple of captains and they picked the teams and it did not feel good to be the last one picked I'll just tell you and sometimes it was especially bad if there were an odd number of people and you were left out entirely man that doesn't feel good does it but in this context it says in Jesus Christ no one gets left out we are all God's chosen ones. We're all equal. We've all been chosen. We're all on the team. We're all holy and loved. We've experienced both of these qualities of God in coming into relationship with God through Jesus. We have become, in a sense, complete and whole in Him because we've been so chosen. You know, our world doesn't like this kind of equality. We always seem to want to find ways to have the ins and the outs the haves and the have-nots. You know, I, in my job, fly quite a bit. And because of that, I'm a fairly high-ranking flyer on American Airlines. In fact, not bragging, but I'm at the top of the American Airlines pyramid. And when I fly on American, they do all kinds of nice things for me. They let me get on the plane first. If the plane gets canceled, they call me with a rescheduling plan. I don't even have to worry about it. They are really nice to me. I'm an elite on American Airlines, and that feels good, unless I have to come to Rock Springs, and then I have to come on United, and guess what? They don't even know my name on United Airlines, and they certainly don't treat me very well. Nothing special there. That's kind of a silly thing to talk about in a message like this, but it just illustrates how in our world, we like to... Divide up into groups, and there's the haves and the have-nots, the elites and the non-elites. There's the people who have and those who don't. We like to rank people and put things in groups, and we kind of like to be in the situation where we're the one that gets the privileges, right? Yeah. But that's not what this verse says. No, this verse says, in Jesus Christ we have unity and we have equality. All divisions have been overcome and all rankings have been eliminated. We're all, e we're all unified and we're all equal. And I don't know about you, but that feels pretty good because I live in a world where that's not always true. And I want it to be true in my relationship with God, in my relationship with my wife, my children, and my church. I want this kind of unity to be evident. Well, 
That establishes the foundation, but it doesn't really get us to the practical working of this. But now we're about to in the text. Because the next section of the scripture tells us that unity is actually accomplished by some choices we make in our relationships. Now let's walk through this together. Look at verse 12. After, therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, there's a little word, two little words, put on. Put on. Now, that's actually in contrast to some other phrases in this same book, Colossians, where it says, put off. And so in some other contexts, we could look at another time, it says, put off some things, but in this context, it says, put on some things. Now, this word, put on, is the same word that could be used to describe what you did when you got dressed to come to church this morning. You put on some clothing. You selected it. You put it on intentionally. It covered you up and made you a little more presentable. You put on something this morning. Now, the Bible says we're to put on some things in our relationships with each other. And just like we put on clothing this morning that was intentionally chosen, that fit, uh, that fit us and made us more presentable, we do the same thing with these qualities. Look at the list. Put on compassion, kindness, Humility, gentleness, and patience. Five important words. Now, sometimes when you're teaching from the Bible, there are words that have really technical meaning, and you need to define those. And I'm sure pastor does that for you when he comes to one of those words in the Bible. But that's not what's happening in this morning's scripture. These words don't need a lot of technical definition. These are pretty straightforward words. We are to put on toward others some behaviors and some attitudes, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, these five qualities. But now, skip ahead just a bit to verse 14 because there's another put on. It says, above all, put on love. So if I were illustrating it this way, if you'll just look this way, you'll see these five words up here in front of us. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And then if you could just put an umbrella over all of that, and that's the word love. So Paul is writing us this text, and he's saying, if you really want to work out this unity and equality we have in Jesus, if you really want to work this out, you have to put on some qualities toward other believers. You have to put on some qualities toward your spouse. Put on some qualities toward your children. Put on some qualities toward your fellow church members. And what are those qualities? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, love. And above all of that, you have to choose, excuse me, above all of that, you put, a, you put love toward other people. Now, this is an intentional choice you have to make to change the way you act toward others. When my children were all in grade school, even Melody, they worked hard to achieve something called self-manager. In our children's grade school, they got a badge that said self-manager. And when you got this, you actually got called up in front of assembly, in front of the whole school. And my oldest son, it took him quite a while to get self-manager. Melody, not quite so long. She finally got it. My youngest son, he got it on the first day. You'd have to know him. But when you got to the assembly and you got called forward and the principal gave you your self-manager button, that said, I can manage myself well enough that I can be trusted in this school with special privileges. And self-managers got to leave class without a permission slip. They, They got to do things in the school that other students didn't get to do. Now, the reason they got to have those privileges was because they had chosen to demonstrate some behaviors that were noticeable enough that it showed everyone they knew how to act in different situations. What I'm trying to show you is that it's possible for an elementary school child and even you to choose how you relate to other people. You really can do this. You can wake up every morning and say, I'm going to choose compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience toward my spouse, my children, and my fellow church members, and I'm going to put love over the whole thing. That's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to choose as a self-manager how I'm going to act, and that's going to demonstrate the unity that I have with my fellow Christians. 
But I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, that sounds good in theory. But even if I put on all five of these and let love cover it all, if I relate to other people that way, what if they don't do it back to me? That's a fair question. You put on these qualities and you demonstrate this kind of attitude toward an action toward other believers and they don't do it back to you? Well, then what are you supposed to do to facilitate this unity we're talking about? Well, let's continue reading in the Bible. Verse, 14, or verse 13 answers the question. It says, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And then as if to say, but if that doesn't always work out, verse 13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, you also are to forgive. So, when you put on these qualities toward other believers, but they don't put them on back to you, what are you supposed to do? Well, two things. Bear with people who aren't acting appropriately and forgive them just as the Lord has forgiven you. Unity requires bearing with and forgiving other people. I know how challenging this can be. Bearing with means, put it in, put it in plain terms, putting up with other people. And forgiving them, that can be challenging. To let it go, just as the Lord has forgiven us, so we forgive other people. But the recipe is laying out here for us in Scripture. First, to demonstrate and live out this practical unity that is described in this passage of Scripture, we put on these five qualities and we let love be the umbrella over it all. And when that doesn't produce unity, we bear with people who aren't acting appropriately and we forgive them. In the moment. Now, the next phrase even helps us more because it goes on to say, verse 15, and let the peace of Christ to which you were called in one body rule your hearts. So, this peace of Christ, peace of Christ or this, uh, yeah, the peace of Christ is going to rule our hearts. Now, I like the word rule here for a special reason. It's a word that really means be the umpire, be the referee, be the one who makes the decisions. Now, for many years, I umpired youth baseball. For actually, for 25 years, I umpired high, Little League through high school up and down the West Coast in Washington, Oregon, and uh, California, and uh, had a really, really tremendous time doing that, as I said, for 25 years. And when umpires step on the field, they're expected to make the call. So you say safe, and you say out, and you say fair, and you say foul. You make the call. You make the decision. And what makes the decision for you is how you see the play in front of you and the way that you think it should turn out. Now, that's what this word rule your hearts means. It means that something gets to make the decision about how you're going to act in the moment. And what is that something? Look back at the first part of the verse. And let the peace of Christ rule your hearts. So, we're seeing a progression here. First, I've said unity is possible in Jesus Christ. All divisions have been overcome. We have unity. All status has been eliminated. We have equality. Sounds good? Now, how do we live that out? We put on these five characteristics that are described here, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We let love be the umbrella over that, and that's how we treat other believers. And when they don't reciprocate back to us in these same ways, what do we do? We bear with them, and we forgive them. And then, when it comes right down to making the decisions in the moment of how you're going to act, you say, what will produce peace? And that's the direction I'm going. What will produce peace? And that's the ruling that gets made. What will produce peace? That's what the referee decided. That's the way we're going to decide, how, how we're going to act today. Now, that leads to a very interesting question, which I only have time to touch on this morning. I don't have time to go into in great detail. But the interesting question is, is there ever a time when Christians are responsible to break the peace? In other words, this passage says, let the peace 
of Christ rule your hearts. In other words, always decide for peace. But is it always for peace? Well, the answer to that question may surprise you, and the answer is no. There are at least two times in the Bible when Christians are called on to break the peace. The first one is when there's serious doctrinal error in a church. Now, when I say serious doctrinal error, I'm not talking about arguing over the color of the carpet or what time the service starts or the style of music that's being sung. That's not serious doctrinal error. But the Bible does have multiple examples throughout the New Testament of people who started teaching things like Jesus is not really the Son of God or there are multiple ways of salvation. These are serious doctrinal errors that actually compromise what we stand for as Christians. And when those things are being taught, the Bible actually says we have to break the peace and confront that and not allow it to go on in our churches. So that's one example. There's another example, and that is there's a, there's a responsibility to break the peace over what, are, what the Bible would describe as blatant, habitual, destructive, sinful behavior. Just one example. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there was a horrible thing happening. Um, a, a, a man had moved into and was living with, in a sexual way, his stepmother. And the Bible says that had to be stopped. That couldn't be allowed in the church. That was just plain wrong. So here's two examples from the Bible when you do break the peace. You break the peace over serious doctrinal error, and you break the peace over blatant, habitual, morally destructive sin. So there are at least some examples in the Bible when it's possible to break the peace. But listen, most of the time, what most of us are dealing with every day in our marriages, in our children, in our families, in our churches, is not those two categories. Would you agree with me? Most of what we're dividing over isn't serious doctrinal error and habitual, blatant, horrible sin. Most of the time we're dividing up over the fact that we don't get our way, things aren't going like we want them to, or some other less serious issue that we're allowing to break the peace. So the Bible says, the Bible says, we have unity in our relationship through Jesus, to Jesus Christ. All divisions have been eliminated. We have unity. All status has been removed. We have equality. And now, because of this, we can actually live differently. We can live out these five qualities I've been listing and put love over the whole thing. And in doing so, really demonstrate unity with other believers. And when people don't act back that way toward us, especially when other believers don't act this way, our first response is to put up with it. And to forgive them. Not to react with anger and selfishness, but instead to extend forbearance and forgiveness. And then you say, well, yeah, but when it comes down to those day-to-day -day decisions about how we're actually going to live as families and churches, what do we make? How do we decide in the moment? You let peace be the umpire. What will produce peace right here? Not what will produce me getting my way or what will produce what I want or what will produce what makes me more comfortable, but what will produce peace in the moment? And yes, yes, there are some biblical examples of when it's appropriate to break the peace. But let's be very sure, very sure that we're in one of those two categories before we make a decision that really does break the peace of our marriages, our families, or our churches. Now, there's one more thing in this passage about how to have unity. And that is that unity is actually undergirded and actually strengthened by worshiping and serving together. Now, look, continue to read in verse 16. In the context of this passage about unity, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Now, I find this striking that this instruction about worshiping together comes at the very end of this passage about unity. So how do you facilitate and undergird unity? Well, you get together. 
and you hear the word of Christ, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell richly among you. There's something unifying about coming to church and hearing your pastor teach you the Word of God week by week and bring to you a commonality of understanding of the Scripture and how to apply it to life. There's something powerful about that. And then continuing in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, but also through what? Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. There's something empowering about coming together and singing and worshiping and enjoying the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the unity that comes from the truth being communicated to each other and around each other through the singing together. Man, that's powerful. There is something unifying that, is, that undergirds and builds and strengthens our unity when we come together and hear the Word of God taught and hear the Word of God sung and celebrate in doing both of those things. Is it any wonder, is it any wonder that churches have been struggling with their unity through the pandemic? What got canceled during the pandemic was public worship. Coming together to hear the Word of God taught, singing the Word of God together. And I know that we've tried to find creative workarounds with online delivery, and I'm for all of that. But it hasn't replaced the power of coming together to do what this passage says. Hear the Word of God taught, sing and celebrate the Word of God in worship times, and in doing that, unity is facilitated. Have you ever felt this? You go to some other church, and the pastor stands up to preach, and he does a good job, but you leave thinking, well, it wasn't as good as Pastor Rodney because it just didn't really fit the way you're accustomed to hearing things taught. Or you go to another church and you experience the worship service and you think, that was nice, but it just didn't quite feel like home because it's not the way Joel does it, not the way we do it at our church. Listen, that's all right. It's all right to be able to go somewhere else and appreciate what they do, but to feel that you're at home when you're here. We saw this illustrated just again this week at the seminary. Uh, our seminary has five campuses, and, the, and, and two of them are in California, including our primary campus, and so that's where I live and work most days. And when we went into the pandemic, one of the things we had to cancel was chapel. And so we haven't been able to gather uh, for chapel. Uh, we've been doing video online, that kind of thing, but in a room like this. We haven't been there in a year and a half. And uh, about 10 days ago, we had our first chapel for the fall, and the room was full. And people sang, and we prayed, and I was the first speaker of the year, which is normal for the president, and I got up and preached the chapel sermon that day. Well, it was one of the best chapel experiences we've had since I've been president, and it wasn't because the music was all that spectacular, or the praying was all that devoted, or the preaching was all that good. Frankly, it wasn't that great, but I got through the job, you know what I'm saying. What made it fantastic was that we were back together. And when the service was over, people came up to me, and and thanked me for calling us back together for chapel. And uh, a couple of people said, nice sermon. And a couple of people said, nice music. And one person even said, thank you for that great prayer time. But while I heard a few comments like that, what I mainly heard from the many people who either came to me personally or emailed me after was, thank you for getting us back together. You see, unity... Yeah, we get it. We're, we're unified in Christ. We get that. We, we know we're unified in Christ and we're equal in Christ. And we know that. But we need some practical ways to work this out, to feel it, to experience it, to build it, to make it a, a, a daily event for us. And one way you do it is just coming together for church, hearing the Bible taught, singing and worshiping together, praying together. It builds unity. So keep doing it. You need it, and it unifies your church. And then look at the next, ver for a, next sentence or next verse because it tells us even another thing we can do to build unity, and it says, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now, frankly, if you read that as a standalone verse, it just basically says, Whatever you do, do it for the Lord, and, and, and it'll bring glory to Him. And I get that. But put it back in the context of the passage, and you see that it's sort of the last capstone on how to build unity. And that is, do things together that honor Jesus. When you 
do things in word or deed in the name of Jesus and giving thanks to God, and in the, in the context of this passage, it builds unity. All right, let me be as practical as I can be. A few years ago, you had a demolition team come and demolish this interior of this building so it could be remodeled into the beautiful facility that it's become. I was on the demo team. I sent an email to my friend Gary, who lives in Missouri, and I said, Gary, they're going to demo, they're going to demo this church, and they're going to rebuild it, and they're going to do all this different work, but the first step is to tear it apart, and I want to know if you'd like to come and spend a week. I'm going to go up there for a week, and we'll just get together, and we'll just, tear, tear, and we'll just work on this demo team. He sends me back a one-sentence email. He said, you had me at demo. <laughs> So my friend Gary came from Missouri, and I came from California, and we got here, and we actually got here a day or two before the rest of the team, and so we started working, demolishing this building, tearing out the bathrooms, tearing out the walls, tearing out the old heating system, just tearing out the carpet, and just all that had to be done to get this place stripped down to where it can be remodeled. And we we made fast work of it those first few days. My friend Gary and I have done this before. You see... For many years in my wallet, I carried a picture. It frankly just wore out. But I carried in my wallet a picture from 1984. It was of my oldest son standing at a little lake with a tiny little fish. He was four years old. And standing around in the background were some different people. And one of them was my friend Gary. My friend Gary and I went on our first mission trip together in 1984 when we were both about 25 years old. We had a bunch of young kids. I had one, I think maybe two. I'm not sure if Melody had been born by that time or not. He had two or three. He wound up with four. I wound up with three. You know how it goes. We started going on mission trips together when we were just young guys with young families. And that mission trip to Kansas, man, that was a rough one. It's about 138 degrees. Maybe not quite that hot, but it seemed like it. We got there, and the church was at the point where they were putting the insulation in the ceiling of, that, of their auditorium that they were building. And the contractor and the pastor were so apologetic, they said, listen, we hate to even ask you to do this, but all the insulation has got to be stapled into those, uh, into those rafters so we can put the drywall up on that ceiling, and it's going to be a nasty, dirty, hot job up there. We said, that's what we came for. We came to do what's next, not what's easy. So we went up that scaffolding, put in that insulation, took most of the week. It was a horrible job. We would leave getting off that scaffolding. We would go out in the, in the parking lot, and we would actually just hose ourselves down with our clothes on just to get all that uh, uh, insulation off of us and get just cooled down. we just stand out there just wet dousing ourselves. 1984. I'm telling you today. If the bottom fell out of my life, I'd pick up the phone and I'd call Gary. And I know he would come because in a couple of times in my life, the bottom has fallen out. And Gary has come to help me. We haven't lived in the same state for almost 20 years. But we haven't lost our friendship and the unity we have in Jesus. And do you know how we have that unity? Because what this verse says, we did things together in the name of Jesus, and it bound our hearts like this, together. You know, I'm, I'm an old guy, and I know that. I'm, I'm a grandfather, and I've been around a while. And one of the best things about getting old is having old friends. To be able to say, for the last 30 years, my friend and I have served Jesus together. We've been on mission trips together. We've built churches together. We've gone out uh, on evangelism projects together. We've, we've done work together. And because of the fact that we've done things together, we have this fabulous unity in Jesus. You know, I work, obviously, among a lot of younger people today, and I hear this word a lot, especially among younger Christians. We want to build community. I say, yeah, I do too. I think community is essential. They said, yeah, we want to build community. That's why we want to get together in a coffee shop and drink coffee and talk about the Bible. I said, well, you can do that, but you're not going to build into community that way. Community is not built by sitting around talking about building community. You know how you build community? You know how you build tight unity with people? 
Go out and do something together that requires some sacrifice. Go demo a church for a week. Go on a mission trip somewhere and put in insulation. Or go somewhere halfway around the world and share the gospel with people like Gary and I have done. You do those things together, you have community. You build something that really does matter. Connections forged by doing things like this verse says, together in the name of Jesus, they bring glory to Jesus. You know, you're having that experience somewhat here in this church. You've planted this church or brought it together a few years ago, and you're seeing God do things among you here, and that binds all of you together in a way that is really special. And you'll look back on this in 20 years and be saying some of the same things. So here's the sermon today. Christian unity. It's more than an aspiration. It can be a reality. We can have unity with our spouses and our families and our churches. We can have it because in Jesus, we have unity. He's abolished all distinctions, and we have equality. He's eliminated all status. We can act out this unity by choosing some qualities that we put on display with each other, letting love be over all. And when people don't act that way back toward us, we bear with and forgive. And in the moment, we let peace make the ruling. We choose what produces peace. And then, and then, to really build unity over time with people, we gather to hear God's word and worship, and we go to serve in the name of Jesus, working hard together and building the kind of unity that comes from shared effort in his name. Unity is more than an aspirational goal. It can be a practical reality if you'll, help, if you'll put this message into practice today. Let's bow our heads together. Just for a moment now, I'd like for you to reflect on this message, and I would like to ask you to prayerfully, quietly just whisper a response to God. First of all, Thank God that he's chosen you and that there is unity and equality in Jesus. You're not a second-rate Christian. You're a chosen one. Thank him for that. And now, would you pray and ask God to help you put on these qualities? God, help me put on compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Help me put on these things to other believers. And let, Lord, let love be over all. And let peace rule my heart. Make the decision for me about how to act. Ask God to help you put on these qualities toward other believers. Now, I can 100% assure you not every believer will act this way back toward you all the time. So now I ask God to help you be forbearing and forgiving when people don't act right toward you. And then will you commit yourself this morning to these things which undergird and really facilitate our practical unity as a church, coming together to worship and hear the word of God and going out to serve and to share life together. These things build unity. Pray and thank God you have a good church and then commit yourself to this church and what it means to be a part of it and the unity that will result from worshiping together and from serving together. Heavenly Father, there is so much in our world that tries to divide us. We're divided over politics and medical care. We're divided over policies and 
prejudices about race, and culture. Oh God, so much tries to divide us. But I pray that you would give us a clear understanding of how to have greater unity based on what we've heard from your word today. And that the unity we can find in you would overcome all the divisions that are trying to harm us, destroy us, weaken our churches and our families today. You've called us to unity and you've showed us how to do it. And we appeal to you to make it a reality for us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Esther? All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us this morning. Here's the picture. This is uh, Dr. Orch and his friend Gary. It's my favorite picture of them pulling toilets out of this church. I got it for you. Uh, that's one of my favorite pictures. But thank you, Dr. Orge, for uh, that message and just for the truth and just the simplicity of it. Uh, there's just so much power in serving uh, with one another and just uh, how that undergirds and, and creates community. We've had some great opportunities this summer to do that through uh, serving at the soccer fields and going on mission trips. And so, uh, so thankful for those of you that joined us in that. I'm going to close with just a few announcements here, and then I'll pray for us. Uh, small group uh, is returning, uh, not this Sunday, but next Sunday, September 12th. It's from 6 to 7 here at the church. Uh, there's child care available during that time. Uh, we'd love to have you join us for that. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, youth group and kids night will return on October 6th. We're moving that to Wednesdays. Uh, that's from 6 to 7 uh, here at the church. Uh, we're having a youth group uh, night for dinner, games, and s'mores next Friday at my house. Uh, the address is on there. Uh, it'll be from 6 till 9-ish probably. Um, if you have questions, uh, let me know about that. And then we're going to have a children's uh, ministry back-to-school uh, event or back-to-school bash on Thursday, September 16th uh, here at the church from 6 to 730. If you got any questions about any of that, uh, talk to me. And I'd love to give you some info. Uh, if you want to serve, uh, there's opportunities to serve in all of those areas, in children's, uh, in uh, preschool, in youth, uh, even in worship. If you have interest in that, uh, come and talk with us. And we'd love to have you join us uh, in serving here at the church. I'm going to pray for us and close us out, and then we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, just for this morning. Lord, we thank you for the beauty of the day. God, we thank you uh, for your message and for your word, uh, that unity uh, is possible in you, uh, God, and it can overcome all of the things that divide us uh, so easily uh, in this day and age. God, we, uh, I just pray for us that you would give us just the, the courage, really, to put on uh, these qualities, Lord, so that we can be uh, people of peace and be, be unifiers. Lord, would you give us the courage and the awareness of where we are lacking in that? Uh, Lord, uh, God, we just thank you just for the opportunities that we have to worship and to gather and to uh, be one in you, Lord. Uh, God, would you help us to just, just appreciate and take advantage of that and, and use those opportunities for your glory? Uh, God, would you give us the courage to serve uh, and to spend our time serving you uh, and coming together uh, for you and for your name's sake? God, we, we love you. Lord, we thank you that you love us. Lord, we thank you that we have uh, just life and peace and unity available in you. Lord, would you uh, help us to walk in you as we go this week? God, we love you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, you are dismissed.